You're listening to the When Life Hands You Lennon's podcast. But in an entry-level film production, it's one strike and you're out. You're fired. I'm not calling you back. If your goal today is to make a basket, we're going to make that basket. The minute you create something, as soon as it's made tangible, you have a copyright in it. How do I get our guys to sound that big, you know, that full when they do the harmonies? And I'm your host, Lennon Seahawk. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I was just looking at all of the podcast episodes the other day and I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of everything and we are nearly at 100 episodes. I am blown away by that number. That is insane because I have sat down with so many amazing people. And as I recap the incredible conversations that I've had, I can't help but be so thankful for all of the love that has been shared on the podcast, that has been shared to me through the podcast, on social media, emails. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited for what's to come with this podcast. Um, so this week's episode features Jim Hustwit. He is a London-based music producer. Now, Jim has made a career in the music industry over the last decade, few decades. In this episode, Jim breaks down what production music is. We talk about how artists and musicians get paid for that, what the differences are being paid as an employee versus a freelancer. We talk about the process behind uh, getting a project and getting assigned to a project. And if you take the full video or the finished video and write music to that, or if you're given kind of a brief and then you write music to that. So Jim, thankfully, is very elaborate in all of his responses and gives a lot of really, really concrete information. So if you're looking to get into production music, trailer music, commercials, ads, all of that stuff, any kind of sync licensing, then this is an excellent episode for you because Jim shares so much information. Now, I want to get into the conversation as quickly as possible, but before I do, I want to remind you to sign up to my email list. You can sign up via my website, which is lennonsiak.com. It's the quickest way for me to notify you when new episodes are live. I would also appreciate if you would follow me on Instagram. That really helps out. Leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify. Just simply click the page on both platforms and you can scroll down and then click the five stars. Lastly, if you or somebody you know would be a good guest for the show, there's a guest request form in the show notes below. Please fill that out because I'm always, always, always looking for amazing industry professionals, music industry professionals who are paving the way for the next generation of music. So without further ado, let's dive in to my conversation with Jim Hustwit. Jim, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I'm really excited to have you on the on the show and chat with you. Yeah, pleasure. Nice. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, of course. So I was digging in and doing a little bit of research on you, and you have done a lot of stuff over your career. So I'm excited <laughs> to dig in and um, and really kind of hone in on a lot of these things. Um, sure. So sync and this type of production music is something that I'm working on building into now. Um, I'm working on a catalog of music myself. I'm collaborating with some friends um, to build up a catalog to then pitch to supervisors and libraries and and all that stuff. So this conversation, I felt like just kind of fell into my hands and a great opportunity to connect. Um, So let's, let's get a kind of a basic understanding of who is Jim? Where are you located? And, and give us a little rundown of, of how you got to where you are today. Who is Jim Hustert? That's the existential <laughs> question, isn't it? Um, okay, yeah. So I'm a sort of music producer and composer based out of London in the UK. Um, I suppose the kind of, without giving my entire life story, my route into music has been maybe slightly unconventional because I, up until about the age of 30, I was... I, I worked in an investment bank and then I worked in marketing um, and at the age of 30, quit everything through caution to the wind, quit it all to pursue a career in music full time. At that specific time, 
I was kind of pursuing the singer songwriter route. So I was performing a lot. Um, I was actually following Ed Sheeran around London. We were often performing at the same, um, the same venues. Um, and then after a while, I kind of, that, I kind of realized that actually I, I wasn't in this to be able to get up on stage and, and perform. It was, I was in the studio. I like being in the engine room. I like just getting with the mechanics of production and writing. And so I, I sort of switched my focus from, uh, from doing the, um, the live thing to sort of get in, into the, the nuts and bolts of production. I dabbled in theater for a bit, um, which was amazing, but again, it's not, it's not being in this studio. It's not getting to create uh, in quite the same way. So, um, so yeah. And I've sort of been through many iterations as a producer. I have uh, produced artists. I've done quite a lot of sort of TV stuff. Um, I still do bits of TV from time to time. I don't produce artists anymore. Um, and yeah, now, as you, you mentioned, production music, I do quite a lot of production music and specifically the moment, a lot of trailer music. Um, I'm writing music for sort of uh, movie trailers. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, I think there's, we could obviously have a whole podcast just on what you've done and everything, but, uh, in the essence of time. Uh, so what is production music? Uh, can you break that down? Yeah, production music is essentially um, pre-made music, which sits on a database, which is then accessible to production teams, editors, uh, people around the world, so that when they are wanting off-the-shelf music for their production, i.e. They, they don't have the time, budget, or inclination to have music bespoke, composed bespoke for whatever reasons, they can literally go onto this database, audition music, and sort of literally handpick music that they want to use it's also kind of set up so that it's very easy to license so if you're talking about commercial artists it gets very complicated because there's a lot of people involved and it can take a long time and it's very expensive to get clearance whereas this music is literally created for use in media and it's very quick and easy um easy to use so so yeah that's that's kind of production music so is that kind of interchangeable with quote-unquote library music yeah um i (laughs) i think I used to call it library music and it's become production music, I think, because basically library music. So up until the point where record labels stopped making music from selling physical Mm -hmm. copies. So basically when the sort of bottom dropped out of the uh, music industry up to that point, record labels and artists would never go near. They wouldn't do library music because it's, it wasn't cool. All of a sudden their, their major revenue stream dries up. So they sort of like turn to, you know, they realize that actually within with publishing with royalties, there's a huge revenue stream there. So they kind of, they, they sort of gravitate towards that revenue stream, but you know, library music wasn't cool. So I almost feel like production music was a way of rebranding library music to make it sound cooler. Mm. Okay. So talk about, I want to talk a little bit about the revenue streams for production music and like direct licensing. Um, and maybe we can get into that a little bit more, but specifically how does one get paid for production music? Like you and I, let's say we worked on a song and, and it gets placed in an HBO show or whatever they use it. What's kind of the revenue stream? So the, the immediate revenue stream there would be if your piece of music gets synced, uh, there is a sync fee. Um, those sync fees vary massively, particularly in the US, because in, in the US there isn't kind of like a rate card. So it's open to negotiation. In the UK, we have something called MCPS, which acts basically as a rate card. So oh. you generally don't command massive sync fees in the way that you can in the US. So that's point one, when the music gets synced. And then there's a residual royalty. Uh, for which you will get from your performing rights society with the PRS, ASCAP, BMI. Um, um, and that's basically when that music is broadcast on television, you will receive a royalty. The size of that royalty depends on how long it was broadcast for, what channel it was broadcast on. So obviously a, a fringe cable channel, would you get less money than you would if it was a, a big NBC sport or something like that. Um, so yeah, so you've got front end and back end. Front end is the sync fee back end is the the royalty so and well well, sorry there is also as well i mean you know depending on the if you're working for a production music library some of those production music libraries will front a fee as well um so Mm. you could get a few hundred dollars as as an upfront fee um on top of that so that's also another form of revenue okay 
So uh, kind of going midi- middle of the road, what would one of those royalties look like um, just for kind of a middle of the road average six month, say, length? It's really hard to say. I mean, it'll give you to give you an idea, and I hope I don't misquote this. So, if if you get a minute of music played on the B on BBC One in the UK, I don't know, I don't know any of the rate cards for the US. Sure. But say, for okay. example, the BBC, it's something like ninety pounds per minute. Okay. Um, for for a broadcast on on the BBC, so obviously, if you have got if you've done a documentary and you've got thirty minutes of music that's going live on the BBC then that all of a sudden gets quite interesting. If mm. that's a long-running documentary or there's multiple seasons, Hello Sailor, you know, you're making some sort of decent money. So it's really hard to say. So like the BBC is that amount. And then, you know, for a small cable, you know, I get my, my royalty report comes through and I'll get sort of like 10 cents through from some channel in Denmark, uh, yeah. five cents from somewhere in France. And then all of a sudden, oh, hello, there's something over here in Japan, which is sort of brought in a thousand pounds so it's it's there are so many variables it's very it's very hard to say but needless to say the the more music the more music you have out there getting used the more you comes in and the more it gets used uh the more Mm -hmm. airtime it has the the higher the fee interesting yeah i've I've always wondered that like what is to take like everybody says you get royalties on the back end every time it airs every time it airs you get royalties well and some people say that they can predict and a lot of people have they can predict what they're going to be getting from their performing rights organization based on what they can guess what is out there and what's running and they keep tabs on all that stuff but like what is a royalty like you know when you stream a song on spotify or apple music you can typically guesstimate how much that royalty is. Of course, there's a very, there's so many variables. If that person is on a paid plan, if they're on a free plan, where they're located sure. and all that stuff. Um, but well, it's, I think it's nice with to Spotify, know. It is a bit more, with Spotify, it is a bit more set because you, I know that for every stream on Spotify, I'm going to, I'm going to receive it's again, this is UK, sorry, but 0.0047 pence. So it's not even a whole yeah. pence. I know that I'm going to get that per listen. So if I get a million listens, then I, I can calculate what I'm going to get. The difficulty with royalties is, and when we're talking about broadcasting TV, is even even the collection societies will have they will have different ways of allocating the money. So basically, the collection society collects money from media owners and puts it all into a big pot. It then assigns that money, that revenue, to artists based on how much um, that the music has been used. But then. So, for example, some radio stations, they would literally go in and, and, and list every piece of music that was used. So you'd know exactly. Others do what's called sampling, where they would take a day and they say, OK, on this day, this music was used. So that they get the, the music. So if, if, if they happen to take a sample on a Wednesday and your music was played on a Thursday, you wouldn't be included in that sample. So there's literally so many variables. And obviously this changes between countries, between yeah. radio versus TV versus main channels versus fringe cable so yeah it's very it's very very difficult to know i mean kudos to the people who don't have to predict their royalties i have never i don't have a clue what's coming in um yeah. on a on a quarterly basis it's always a it's always a well, it's usually a nice surprise actually because the more sure. music you do the generally the it will go up but there's also a huge there's you know there's quite a big time delay between the music being used and you receiving anything particularly for anything abroad so for anything that i do that gets used in the u.s you're talking probably two to three years before i start to see that music wow. that, th- those royalties coming through it's a bit quicker wow. in the uk but even then a year to two years that far out wow mm. i was thinking maybe a year year and a half but it's upwards of three years it can be yeah it depends again there's like there's so much going on in the background you never really yeah. know what's actually happening but certainly if it's collected in the us and it, then it's reported to the uk and then it's only reported to me or if you're sort of doing that through sub publisher i mean just yeah so it's, yeah. it's a mind oh my goodness <laughs> There's yeah, there's too many hands in the there's too many people in the kitchen. I think, and if yes. if we could simplify it, it would obviously make things quicker and smoother, and more efficient, and hopefully more transparent for musicians like yourself, so you can see mm. what is going to come through and adequately budget and put food on the table. Yes. Um, so well, I think that's, produ- that's something to, worth saying about production music is because there is that that delay. It's actually quite hard to sort of use production music as something to pay the bills with when i started out i had to there was only so much time i could allocate to production music because i knew i wasn't going to see anything i mean it's a gamble as well depending on the library you're doing stuff for you know you could do music that never gets used 
So mm-hmm. it, it, there's no there's no given that you're going to receive uh, royalties. But as time's gone on and my royalty payments have got bigger, I can actually sort of use that to buy me some time, knowing that in eighteen months more more will come in. Mm-hmm. So for production music, you have what a catalog of say ten songs. You upload it to the production library, and they pay uh, um, an independent filmmaker will pay a subscription for say $10, $15 a month. And then they want to use that song or how does, how does that work? So it depends. You've got different tiers of libraries. So at the sort of the bottom end of this, this sort of tiering, you've got people like pond five and premium beats where um, it's a set fee, $50. You use this um, piece of music. Whereas with say for universal or BMG sort of like the, the sort of the bigger companies, mm-hmm. um, that that's sort of open to negotiation it depends on the production um mm. uh, depends on you know how much usage it's going to get so there's there's all sorts of variables there um but in terms of getting the music on there i mean basically the the, the big libraries tend to they will they know what they want they have briefs so they've got supervisors out there with their ears to the ground they know that this music is getting used a lot they know that they don't have that in their catalog so they'll approach composers that usually that they've worked with before so it's 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 quite hard to get in to working with the production music library. So they'll approach those composers and say, Hey, I need an album of, of 10 songs of, you know, filmic folk, for example, which is what I, I did for universal. Um, and so then you sort of create that you back and forward with the producer to sort of refine it down and make sure it's what they want. And then, um, and then, yeah, they sort of take that. They then market that, um, which obviously the bigger the catalog, the harder it is to market, but you know, they will market to their contacts, their media contacts, Normally, quite quickly, you can. Well, I don't see that, but if I talk to the production media library, they do. They can see how many downloads that album has had, so they mm. can sort of see within a short period of time, like, okay, how many people have downloaded. Obviously, the more people download that, the better, because it means that someone's listened to it and gone, oh, that's great, that's going to be really useful. Um, mm. But then thereafter, you know, it could sit on a hard drive for you know, a year before somebody goes, oh, I'm definitely going to use some filmic folk for this. Um, so um so yeah it's it's normally to order um rather than although although you know with pond five i think there is uh, to be honest i've not got anything on pond five or premium b i think they do have i think they may have people who sort of check um the sort of quality and things like that because obviously there's they there's no point in them having thousands of tracks of exactly the same thing um so generally what they're trying to do is balance out the catalog to make sure that they fill gaps or that they've They've got a nice balance of lots of different things because you know there's so many people doing so many different sort of um, productions that they're going to need a, a wide variety of different music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just working with a client who was using Pond Five to get her music, and um, it when I was going through, she picked a few songs. I'm like, ah, let's try something different. Let me look to see. I was kind of acting as a music supervisor. Okay, great. And it was like for a, a an Amazon page that she needed for her book that she's coming out and then a speaking engagement thing. And this, the music didn't work. So we went on there and it was a lot of very like happy, corporate, cheesy kind of, uh, that's kind of happy go lucky stuff. Um, almost like looped. And then you could find songs that were, 10 minutes long that would just loop over and over and over again for yeah. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, yeah. yeah. And then you would pay $50 to uh, get that song or $35 or however it was priced. Sure. Well, yeah, you can, it's funny because you can sometimes see that I sometimes watch, I mean, I quite often use the generated content stuff on YouTube you, mm. or people do, do show reels or, or corporate videos and they basically sort of have a five minute video with the same piece of music repeating over and over again and by the end of it you're just sort of it doesn't matter what's happening visually you're sort of so bored of it um yeah. and i think you know what makes that's one of the things that makes a great piece of production music is that it it takes you on a journey it builds it drops it ebbs and yes. flows it has personality and it feels like you know it's developing and takes you somewhere um so um so yeah i think there's um there's a difference in you know quality i mean this is the thing i mentioned before the kind of the, the fact that the record labels have sort of gravitated towards sync as a, as a revenue mm. stream what that has done is that's pushed the sort of quality bar up because you're now competing mm. with music which is mixed by the world's top mix engineers um you know guys yeah. have been doing it for 50 60 years and um so the quality of the music has gone up so you know in, you, in order to compete you've got to be sort of 
producing mixing at the at the sort of a really high level. Um, I think that's where you know sort of smaller libraries like Pond Five and something you know that's a great place to cut your teeth because the the quality bar is not sure. quite as high. So if you know you're you're starting out, um, it's sort of a, a good time to sort of get in. Um, yeah, and much easier than sort of trying to compete with what um, some of the bigger libraries are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, you know all the the tactics are going to be very similar. The streams are going to be similar. The operations are going to be similar from Pond Five all the way up to the bigger libraries. Um, so yeah, you get to uh, get your feet wet and understand how the business is running on a very basic level. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that's yeah. It's it's yeah. Everybody's got to start somewhere. That's yeah. That's true. for sure. Um. um so. so you said you're doing a lot of trailer music. Uh, yes. Talk about how trailer music is very different from production music. And uh, I listened to your, this is more of a commercial one, but I listened to your Bosch one that, that you did, you had on your website yes. and you did like three different musical transitions within that. So I thought that yes. was very interesting. Mm. Act, three acts. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I, so I've, I've, I started out as a singer songwriter. So I think mm. I always used to have the challenge when I sort of first started out producing music was I'd have an idea, a riff. It usually started on the guitar because guitar was my, is probably, well, no, it's by piano is actually my main writing instrument now. Mm. Cool riff or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, where do I take this? And actually, mm. when I started writing songs, it was like, okay, cool. Verse, pre chorus, chorus. You've got three different sections. You've got your verse, your pre-chorus, your chorus. Those, each of those sections will be slightly different in some way. Um, and it's interesting how when you sort of look through then production music and trailer music, you kind of working in acts, and each act has a you know slightly different emotion or is, is a slightly different journey to the act that's come before it. So trailer music, I mean, <laughs> trailer music is like a – so the Bosch advert that you saw – that was a funk track. That was great fun because I got to go into the studio with bass player, drummer, and a brass section, and we recorded that, and it was it was brilliant. Yeah. But by having three different sections in there, you're giving the editor, and the editor is 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 the really important person within the. When it comes to production music, you you've got to think about what the editor wants because ultimately yeah. the editor is telling a story with visuals. Your music is to support that narrative with music. So you've got to think, what does he want? If he's got three different sections, he's got three different sort of emotions, three different journeys, three different sort of dynamics to use in telling his story. Um, so, yeah, so you, you kind of see this pervasive three-act structure um, in production music, but then trailer <laughs> trailer music takes it to a whole new level because it's like, it's like a bombastic slap in the face with a wet fish. It's all about the all about the drums. It's all about the risers, and it's basically it's just it's production music on 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 speed. It's um it's yeah. it's it's crazy, um, but it's obviously with the trailer. So it's interesting. On, on a podcast recently, I was chatting to an editor, Paolo, who was talking about he has he's cut narrative and he's cut trailer, and with a trailer, when you're doing a trailer, the editor is sort of basically trying to condense the story, you know, story into two minutes so you can take scenes out of context you can use dialogue from one scene and put it under another scene and then you've got this super accentuated sort of music underneath which is you know however loud you think the drums are mixed you know make them louder um and that is very different to you know actually sort of doing narrative where there's much more nuance um, and you can take time to tell the story so you're you're basically with a trailer Obviously, I'm doing this, and obviously, people listening won't be able to see. But think of it as a wedge. You've got this kind of wedge where basically it's just building, building, building into this epic, explosive finale. Um, mm. And and yeah, it's ten I mean, it's tension at the end of the day. I think same with production music. You're creating tension because by creating tension and then releasing it, you're kind of playing with people's emotions and engaging people emotionally. And that's that's ultimately, I think, you know, even commercial music, that's what you're doing. You're, if you can engage someone emotionally with a piece of music, then you very much have their attention. And I think that speaks to commercial music, that speaks to production music and, and trailer and beyond. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, you? it's a lot of really epicness throughout this, and it's <laughs> yes. all about the drums, it's all about the rise, it's all about the cymbals, it's all about all the percussion stuff. So uh, what are some of the libraries or sounds that you're finding helpful when creating these? Is there a specific library that you resort to? Yeah, I mean, I am a big fan of Damage or Damage 2, mm. um, which is the, it's Heaviosity. Yeah. Um, they've got some big epic drums, which are really good. Um, I rely on Spitfire uh, a lot. I think Spitfire do some beautiful um, uh, virtual 
um, libraries. So like their symph- symphonic uh, stuff, um, mm-hmm. they've got some um, the Iceni library, which I think actually is on its way out. But they've got this Iceni library, which is basically super low brass and cellos. You know, that's that's very much the sort of um, the trailer sound. You know, when you're in the cinema and you've just got this bam. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I think Spitfire and, and Damage. There's also, I mean, Spitfire have got a cool thing, Hans Zimmer Percussion, which mm. which is good. It's very expensive for what it is, um, yeah. but it's it's beautifully sampled and, and sounds great. So I, I swear by Spitfire. I think tend to gravitate towards Spitfire a lot. Um, I mean, I, I'd also, probably not less so with trailer music, but I always try to do stuff out of the box as well because I uh, think sure. when you're relying solely on in the box, everything sort of becomes quite robotic and so for example the way you would program a rhythm on on a keyboard would never be quite the same way that you'd play a shaker or or do it with sticks outside the box so by taking things outside the box you also humanize um, and that's something i think that the human ear knowingly or not does pick up on it sort of it feels real um and Mm -hmm. that humanizing and and you know quantizing i mean I, I, i think you know you're a you do sort of electronic music don't you so you're probably used to sort of very much quantizing stuff to grid um which is very yeah. you know with edm and that sort of thing you're you're going to be doing but even then just having like a shaker in the background which is played in and, and not quantized um will just kind of give it that sort of slightly human feel and um yeah you listen to stuff like bonobo um there's always sort of live instruments in that and um yes. you know he's always sort of doing you know, stuff by hand as well to kind of just give it that sort of human human edge um mm-hmm. but yeah and then in, in terms of plugins i mean i i use a lot of the uad stuff um so ah. universal audio um Classic. big fan of all of their plugins most of all the compression and a lot of the stuff that i put through my music through is going through that um mm-hmm. and I, sound toys i mean decapitator i probably oh, use yeah. decapitator more than more than i should i should probably just find a different distortion <laughs> plugin and try and be a little bit more experimental but i just this goes on everything yeah yeah um that's that's really interesting um i think even in edm there's sometimes i find myself using um more human elements like one song i just finished up had a had a bass guitar and it's pretty repetitive throughout the whole track but it's kind of this funky with this underlying four on the floor but I'm thinking, okay, this is a bass guitar. This is meant to be played by a person. So what do I have to do to give it that human feel? Um, yeah. Obviously, when you're working with a dance sample that was generated by a, a, a sampler uh, or a serum or something, it, it's going to be the same sample over and over and over again. But when you have instrumentation, it's not humanly possible to play the same thing exactly the same yeah. over and over yeah. again for three minutes long. I think that's it. It's it's you think about kind of the the real world variables when a bass player is is playing. Not only would he not play the same thing over and over again, you know, he'd do little fills going into different sections. He, as a musician, he would just be able to sort of ever so slightly recreate that riff every time. Um, as you sort of approach a chorus, he might start playing a little bit harder because the energy is ramping up. And then when you drop out of the chorus into the verse, we drop it down. So there's so many kind of different variables going on that yeah if you're you know using samples that you 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 don't get i mean i think of it with a with a piano as well you know when i play a chord on a piano you know when you sample a piano you're basically sampling note by note but the thing is when you play a you know multiple notes on a piano they're all those strings are all interacting with each other in a different way and you're getting different harmonics out and it will never be the same twice so if you know if i play the same chord a hundred times the way that piano resonates will never be exactly the same because certain you know the air temperature might change or my position yes. might change or something so the, yeah those the variables of physics are what kind of create these sort of beautiful um i always think of it as like imperfections i think mm-hmm. you know imperfection in music i think you know as humans we we like those imperfections you take a, a groove like a, a funk drummer you know the slight imperfection in the way he's playing is that's the groove so um mm-hmm. so yeah so i think wherever possible just tapping into that and just providing that human element even with electronic music i think it just adds a richness um that yeah. the listener probably wouldn't be able to go that's what's happening but they'd, they'd feel it on some level mm-hmm. yeah and with electronic music everybody's so used to the four on the floor or these very very strict hard quantized stuff but 
getting that track to stand out might all it might take is a a, a shaker that's played by a human or that you recorded in or something that you found around the house that you're playing in and recording that has that human element. And you'd be like, yeah. what is that? What is yeah. that sound? And it's just even it's look, that, looking around the room, just simple. like, you know, banging on this, this. Yeah. yeah. Banging on my water flask or tapping the piano or something. And so with it, with the trailer music that I, I do with, um, with audio socket, it's all in the box. Everything is sort of programmed, but, we always at least get the violins doubled up by a real violinist because mm. I think, you know, going back to what you were saying about samples, you know, virtual uh, instruments, they're amazing. I liken it to CGI, you know, CGI in a movie. It, it sure. looks amazing CGI, but we know mm. it's CGI and it doesn't yeah. matter how good it gets. We'll still know it's CGI. And I think the same is said of, can be said of virtual instruments, you know, as good as they get on some level, the listener knows it's not real. They don't know they know it's not real, but there's just something missing. So mm. yeah, with with the trailer stuff that we do, we always go in and have a real violinist double up the, the violin parts because, again, that adds that sort of human element um, and a, a kind of a richness and gloss, which almost tricks the listener into sort of going, oh, this must be a real orchestra when you know it's not. Ninety percent of it or eighty percent of it is is in the box, but just mm. those those violins and that human emotion that's coming through the, the strings being played. It's it just adds a whole new level. Yeah, it does. It gives it that human feel for sure. So for somebody who has, let's say they've worked on a trailer song and that's kind of the, the avenue that they want to take is is trailer music, but they don't necessarily have the budget to outsource or getting an orchestra. Like getting an orchestra is not going to be $50. It's it's expensive. It's going to be $50,000. Um, so, Fifty thousand dollars, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, how would somebody like myself, for example, would be a good example? Just trying to get, I, I compose this track, and now it needs that that next oomph, and getting an orchestra would be the next step. So, how do I make that leap, or what are the gaps that I need to fill before I get to a full orchestra? So, I think so. The way I did it, so with the the album that I sort of pitched to Universal, which was kind of my calling card and what got me on their radar, I was determined to, because I had an experience where I was I was asked to um, get a band together and go into the studio and record a load of music cues for a theatre production, The Merchant of Venice, like a Shakespeare. Um, they, the theatre production didn't have the money to have a live band every night, but they wanted the music. So mm. I went to a studio, got a load of players together, and we recorded the cues. And one thing that became very, very apparent to me was the power of having people who are masters of their own instrument. So, you know, as well as I can, as well as I can program a trumpet sample on a computer, it's never going to be as good as someone who's been studying trumpet for the past 20 years and just plays it like an absolute demon. So that, that learning for me was like, I don't I knew it, but I saw it in practice. I was like, wow, this just, this has an energy to it, which I would never have been able to recreate by programming. So with my tracks, I, I produced a load of tracks which I pitched to Universal. And I was adamant that all of them, that it would basically, they would all be made using real instruments. So real drums, guitars, my instruments, that's fine. Um, bass, I can kind of play my way around if it's a more complicated bass part, I get a bass player in. Um, and then there was cellos and strings. And, you know, what I did was I approached um, students um, at the sort of local Ooh. music school and I said, look, I can't, I don't have loads of budget because, I, you know, I didn't. I was very much funding this myself. It was a it was a sort of opening project, but I, I gave them something to sort of, for their time, I think like 50, 50 bucks, 70 bucks or something like that. Said, you know, will you come in and just sort of play on this? So got a cellist in and asked her to sort of play the cello line. Sometimes maybe, it depends. If you get solo strings in and they're just sort of playing it once, you kind of get very much a sort of solo string feel. What you can do is you can multi-track that. So if you have you know, a violinist mm. play the same bit over and over again and you layer them up, all of a sudden it thickens it out. Uh, one thing to be very careful with that, though, is if you're, again, this was talk, what we were talking about a minute ago, if you record the same violin in the same room with the same microphone with the same person and the same bow, you tend to get phase and mm. the, the, the string takes will cancel each other out. So there's little things that you can do, like, um, you know, get the person to use a different violin if they've got a second violin. If they haven't got a second violin, at least a different bow. Get them to shift their position. So if they're playing face on the first time round, get them to shift to the left the second time round, um, and different things like that. Again, you're just basically trying to recreate the variables of what would be happening if you had sort of 
10 violinists sitting together um and and yeah and and that just doing that and just having people come in and play for you know 70 bucks and then layering that in with your with your samples will give you you know it will it will it will just elevate that piece of music to you know what beyond what it would have been had you just relied on samples and so that's just sort of like a cost effect i mean hey if you've got a friend that plays the violin and they're prepared to do it for free um but i just i think in the music industry there's all too often an expectation for people to do things for free so i never I never really i did in the beginning i think you know with my singer songwriter stuff some people were very generous with their time um but it got to a point where even if it's a nominal fee of you know 20 bucks 30 bucks just to say thank you i appreciate your time just try and enroll people in, in doing that and um and and that that can make a big difference yeah that's yeah. that's a really good point um it's it's really interesting because you think of all the people that you have friends with that are friends with and what instruments they can play and how you yeah. could enlist them, even if it's a guitar. I mean, with today's digital world, you don't have to be in the same city. You could be have yeah. a friend in Sweden or Germany that is a master cellist, have yep. them record something and send it over, send over the wave file. It's absolutely it, it's it's that easy. Um, and then obviously yeah. you can s- the guy that does the strings for me, he's in the US. He records remotely from the US, uh, and I'm sure there's loads of guys in the UK that could do it, but I just don't don't know them. <laughs> I know this guy, and he's he's amazing. Like every time he sends yeah. it back, he kind of, uh, you know, as I'm getting towards the end of a piece of music, I've been working on it for a week, two weeks, or whatever. I kind of, you know, my my excite, the initial enthusiasm starts to wane a little bit. I'm like, oh, come on, let's get this one finished and move on to the next one. Yeah. And then when he sends back the strings and I put them in, I'm like, wow, it just it just breathes a whole new life into it, and I kind of. Mm you know, I get excited about the truck again. Yeah. I remember when I was in school too, I had a, a, a professor, we were in the studio, we had to write a song and then we had to have one or two live instruments on it. And a few of our professors, one of them was a cellist. Another one was a violinist and another one was a guitar player. So we had a few different things to choose from, but the, the assignment was to have at least one live instrument and we had to score it to have that person play it. So I had a cello on it and when they played the cello versus what I had sequenced in, it was like totally changed. And I'm like, I had this whole new excitement for this track. And I mean, I had worked on it for the past month for this assignment. We had continually added new things like, okay, this week your assignment is to add a drum groove and this week is to add a melody and this week is to add, you know, and then finally we had a score for an instrument and I was so sick of this song and finally they recorded this cello in and I just had this excitement, this newfound excitement and uh, it breathed a totally new life into it. And it's just, yeah. it's interesting how that works. I think as well, like you take that a step further is, you know, within, so I recently scored a, a horror film and Ooh. I invited in a nickel harpist. So a nickel harper is kind of like a violin. It's a, it's a Nordic violin but you, it's got keys rather than pressing on strings with your fingers. And when the girl came in to play, Lucy, she was incredible. And we got some amazing results. But what I realized, I'd basically written the parts and she came in and played them. But what I actually realized was, I think if she'd have come in at the beginning of the creative process and we'd explored her instrument, I think we would probably have got better results. Because this is mm. the thing is, you know, unless you play that instrument, you don't know what it's capable of. So to right. tap into somebody who knows their instrument and can get weird and wonderful sounds out of it and knows what's and sometimes you know I think I've been guilty in the past of you know when I when I play in a string line I restrict myself to what I can feasibly play in but you know a good string player can play things a lot faster and a lot more complex than I can play on a keyboard so right. having someone in early stages to almost help with that creative process and understanding what they they can do opens up this whole world and actually may in, result in the in the piece of music going in a slightly different direction and maybe even more interesting direction that you might have been able to take it on your own Mm -hmm. and then that doing those little riffs it inspires little new ideas oh let's 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 do that let's try this let's elaborate on this that's fun um i remember too i saw a video with hans zimmer where he was talking about how he composed one of the batman movies and he was talking about his kind of theme for joker was just the string sound and he took a razor blade to a guitar and that's what it was. And it's like, who would have ever thought like you wouldn't be able to get that in the box. That's something that, I mean, let me look for this razor blade sample meets the guitar and (laughs) it's, it was so unique. Um, But thinking about those types of things can really elevate, really elevate the mix. 
and as you say it's unique it it sets you apart because you're using you know if you know people have probably heard a lot of omnisphere patches before whereas actually if you can kind of create your own pads and your own patches and your own sounds that that lends to your own unique creative voice Mm -hmm. absolutely so you going back to kind of when you got started and you still do a lot of production music and you were hired by universal and sony and all these things um do you do a lot of independent work and then license that music out or do you do a lot of kind of w2 uh employee work where the potential owner may be universal or sony or is is that how that works so most of the most of the music that I've done has so when you when you work for a production music library and depending on the gig, quite often you are signing over the rights to that piece of music to Universal or Sony because they need to be able to exploit that in any way they can. And right. that's you know I touched on at the beginning one of the things that makes it very difficult to to license commercial music is because you've got publishers, you've got record labels, you've got artists, and the more people you have to go through to get clearance and then somebody says, oh, well, I'm not happy with that fee, it gets really, really complicated. So with production music, you sign over the rights so that basically the production music library can do whatever they want with that. They they get to control it. That's mm. part of what makes production music attractive um, and highly usable. Um, so I, I have a few things out there which are sort of, um, I've produced a, uh, one particular artist Callum McIntyre um, and so I mean I technically own the master rights to, to that music because I'm the sort of record label behind that um, and uh, another group called Copperbox um, so I own the, the rights to that but generally most of the music that I do um, is usually commissioned um, on a freelance basis because you mentioned sort of I don't know what W2 is, but I'm imagining that's some kind of employment thing. I think it's a um, U.S. term where it's like yeah. if you're full 40 hours, full employee with full benefits and all that stuff, they're taking. Yeah, no, it's none of that. I'm 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 freelance, and I honestly don't think I could ever go back to being employed ever again. Um, yeah. I I get to do what I want when I want, but the, the the difficulty of that is that you know I if I take a holiday, I'm not getting paid, um, and I have right. to go out and find find the work myself. Um, yeah. so no, I'm, I'm I'm very much freelance. Um, which you know. You don't have that kind of security, but at the same time, I, I don't have to ask for time off. I um, very much decide what projects I, well, to a certain extent, what projects I do. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, most of the music I, I do even then is the rights are assigned to somebody so that they can exploit it. I don't, I'm quite lucky in that most of you know the music that I've done has, has been picked up and, and, and used. So um, I do have the rights to some stuff, but weirdly, the stuff that I own the rights to <laughs> doesn't get exploited as much. So earns me less money so it's kind of almost in my interest to have you know somebody else own the rights and exploit it on my behalf because sure. there's only so many hours in the day and i want to be making music rather than sort of trying to pitch it for projects and things right do you have an agent or anything that does that no i don't i am uh, literally i've done it I've been diy um my whole career um and it's interesting cause someone asked me the other week whether i would work with an agent um i mean obviously i, I have agents in the fact that you know i work with people who i make music for and then they exploit it but i don't sure. have anyone kind of representing me per se right. okay. um and agents i don't know i i get the impression that a lot of agents they they'll happily take 20 percent, but they're not necessarily very active in generating work i think it might be different in the u.s and this is a uk thing um yeah. but no I'm, I've, I've just always been diy um i mean it would be useful to have someone out there touting me and, and generating work um but um it's just not something that's you know ultimately an agent is interested in you when they think they can make a lot of money um yeah. so um yeah it's I, I i'd consider it but um yeah no, i'm diy kind of guy cool yeah that's that's how i am i like to have con kind of control over everything and and uh yeah we, we control freaks we do we don't like yeah, we're to control uh, relinquish control to anyone else yeah Especially when it comes to music, the art that we've worked so hard on, it's hard to just pass it off to somebody who's just looking at it as a quick, you know, dollar sign. And it's like, that's yeah. not what this is. This is something I did two weeks on and spent 45 hours on. And yeah. it's, it's like, I, I need you to take care of it as, as this I would. This is my baby. Hard, this is my baby. It's hard to pass that kind of power and, and love off to other people. Mm. Um, um. So I, I want to go back to the Bosch campaign a little bit and that song that you wrote for it um, was very interesting because it had 
like we said, numerous kind of genres and avenues that you took with it. Um, but you also mentioned in the description that Bosch came to you. So I'm like, okay, how are you getting companies like Bosch to come to you? Like, what's that process like? How do I recruit people to use my music? Yeah, that that's probably a bit misleading because it wasn't Bosch directly. It was through an agency who agency. were working with Bosch directly. So I think this is the thing is when you're looking at the big, you know, multinational corporations like Bosch or like Apple, they when they've when they've got a campaign, a marketing campaign, sometimes they do it internally, but quite often they outsource it to a marketing agency. Mm-hmm. That marketing agency then may sometimes do music in house. They may go to a music agency um, Mm -hmm. and ask the music agency. But ultimately, the the, the corporation at the sort of top of the ladder doesn't want to be dealing with hundreds of individuals. They want to go to someone. So they'll go to a music supervisor who has relationships, has a catalogue of music at their disposal, um, which just facilitates the whole process. So, so yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's not a case of having Bosch come to me it's more a case of me trying to put myself on the radar of mm. the agencies that get these jobs so that mm. as and when they have uh, a budget for some bespoke music, um, they sort of then come to me and say, hey, Jim, we've got this, this campaign, we need this bespoke. But even then, you know, quite often you're pitching. Um, so with with that Bosch campaign, there was, a, there was a pitch process. We sort of put together, I put together, I think I put together about three or four different ideas and sort of sent them through to the animatic which is the kind of the initial sort of just sketches of you know what what they'd envisaged this was before they'd shot anything um and you sort of pitch and you never know how many people you're pitching against i mean there there could be like 20 30 40 100 different composers all pitching ideas. probably not 100 because it's very difficult to go through that um and then you know hopefully you you get the gig so um so yeah i think it's yeah it's making yourself known to the people that are getting these music searches um, and that's quite often publishers, sync agents. Um, so it's more a case of developing a relationship with them rather than the the end user. Right, right. So if you want to get placed in an Apple commercial or an Apple ad, it wouldn't be going directly to Apple. It would be finding out who the creative agency is putting together these commercials and overseeing this stuff. Yeah. Um, so for example, I, supervisor. I got placement on an Apple um, ad, sort of like a, a social thing. Uh, and that came through Ninja Tune. Um, so I've done some music for uh, basically a small record label in, in the UK called Ninja Tune. Um, and that piece of music got sort of picked up for that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, and when when you have this music, are you, you talked about it just briefly in, in your answer. Um, are you getting the, a brief and then just saying this is what we want, or are you getting the full commercial and being like, "Here's a video, compose something to it, and then you know send us your ideas?" Yeah, sometimes it depends. I mean, I think with with that one, it was actually just a, a piece of pre-made music, so that was actually production music that I'd done. Um, I did a campaign for a sort of big soccer team uh, in the UK at the end of last year, which was very much bespoke. Um, they'd shot all the footage already; they'd sort of put together a rough edit. Um, um, and they even had sort of like a temp track because quite often an editor, editor will want to sort of ascertain a certain rhythm. So then they take mm-hmm. out the temp track and send it through and say, right, put this to picture. And then obviously what I'm doing is I'm writing something which is bespoke, which reacts to what's happening on screen. And obviously you can use a piece of production music, but it's you're limited to what the piece of production music does. Whereas with with this, I could I could stop at a key place to 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 highlight a certain moment and or certain words that were being said. Um, and I can make sure that the music is ebbing and flowing with the visuals and really reacting to them. And I, you know, that creates a more compelling journey, a more engaging journey than just having a piece of music, you know, sat mm-hmm. underneath it. Um, but then other times it's a case of, you know, they're just looking for the right track. And, you know, again, it's interesting. I was chatting to um, an editor on my podcast and he was, he was talking about how he auditions music. Um, and what he's listening for. So he's the editor is very visual. They rely on the waveform. So they're looking at you know what the waveform looks like. It's going first of all, first five ten seconds. D- does this have the emotion, the feeling that I need? And it's not even an intellectual thing. It's just a feeling. And then mm-hmm. once they've ascertained yes, it does. It's like okay, does it have a beginning? Does it have a middle? Does it have an end? And does it have those in the sort of right places and in the right way that I need them? 
And if so, yep, great, you're on the short list. And then I'll go through and audition lots of other pieces of music. Um, so, so yeah, it depends on the project. Some people might come to you. I'm like, I did one job last week pitched and it was literally two stills. There was no, because they want to shoot the video. They want to shoot the film to the music because it was very kind of integral to the music. Uh. Um, so yeah, it changes. It is very much dependent on, you know, the, um, the, the type of production and, and where they're in, a, where they are at in that process. Well, it must be difficult for the people who are looking at EDM music because it's just one big sausage. You can't tell which part of the song is. <laughs> yeah, well, like, I suppose yeah, that's that's there's maybe there are limitations in that. But again, I think you know if there's um that I think that's arrangement. You know, you, it's still possible to kind of arrange EDM. I, I, it depends. It depends as well because I think this is the thing is there's the there's the purest artist hat, and then there's the I'm writing music for someone else hat. So if yeah. if it's if you're an artist and you're just writing it because this is my my artistic expression, mm-hmm. I don't want to be mm-hmm. restricted by you know convention or I don't want to be restricted by its usage. Then that's fine. But if you are writing something that you hope to have used in TV or film, then you have to sort of maybe put your take your artist hat off, leave that at the door, and come at it from a point of view. Okay, well I'm I'm creating something which is going to serve something else. So I have mm-hmm. to be conscious of that. So if you did, did, did EDM, which had sort of like, you know, clear different acts and different structures and a real sort of journey, but obviously then that probably wouldn't work um, if you were to sort of take it into a club. So it's that just balancing the two. Art versus commerce. Yes, that's true. That's a good point um, is is taking those hats off and differentiating where do I want this track to be used? Do I want it to be used in a club and get everybody up on their feet or do I want to be tackling that emotion that people have in their living rooms uh for yeah. this show um yeah that's that's a good point so how do you when you get us when you get a, a a project how are you deciding the genre and the style of the 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 music that you want to use well i think usually usually the client has a rough idea of kind of what they want it's quite sure. rare that somebody comes to me and goes, carte blanche, you can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> okay. I'd also be quite wary of that because, okay. you know, how many iterations of how many iterations of a piece of different pieces of music would you have to go through until you eventually hit, you know, what they want? I think right. certainly understanding the, the client, who the end decision maker is, is important and what they want. So, you know, this is, I think the first part of any kind of thing like that is really getting inside the head of, the person who's making the decisions what do they want um and even what do they like because if you can get an understanding of what music they like it might not be relevant to the project but you'll start to get an understanding for what you know you might send that might work for them so you know i think that's a big part of any job is like trying to get inside the head of the person at the end use it what they're going to be using it for and how they're going to be using it and if you can do that that will inform the process but normally they'll you know i brief i was working on last week they wanted something sort of motown sort of mo i think motown funk rock i didn't get the rock bit funk rock or or pop pop mm. pop thing so there was a, there was a rough idea and then after that you're sort of like going okay well you know what 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 works well for that you've got i actually so if, i hold my hands up i think the job i did last week i think the two ideas that i pitched were too fast i think genre wise mm. they were they were good but when I listened back to them, they were too fast. So there's there's things like tempo. You've got to sort of think, you know, giving the visual space to breathe. You don't want to rush off into something crazy. Um, so hopefully there's, I mean, sometimes there's, you know, there'll be a send references as well. Sometimes you'll go to Spotify playlist with a number of references on we like these tracks. Oh, Your wow. job then is to go listen through to all of those tracks. I mean, it's very much the same with a, a production music brief. Listen to those tracks and understand, okay, what's happening in all of those tracks what are the consistent elements throughout all those tracks that i can mm-hmm. draw on to then sort of create something which isn't copying them because it's you don't want to sound alike it's a feel alike so what things can i draw on in, in my music which is going to make my track sort of sit in that playlist and work with those whilst also being unique and different um so um so yeah depends on project by project basis carte blanche is scary i mean it's great but it's scary and it's probably going to take longer to to get it right um, but usually there is some kind of, they've had the conversation, they've got a rough idea. And do you have people that, that come to you and they're like, okay, we want something kind of metal and really dance music-y. 
uh, is that something you would turn down or is that something like, yeah, I, I can figure that out? No, I, I, I probably could figure it out and I yeah. have done in the past, but I think uh, I'm at a point in my career whereby if somebody wants some sort of death metal, I would have to say, look, you know, if you want authentic death metal, you need to go to uh, somebody who produces death metal. I mean, I have a, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to ever be pigeonholed as doing just one thing. Sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, for me to start doing dubstep, it's it's tricky because there's also the the, the technical nerd in me would go, oh right. yeah, I'd love to sort of drill down and start doing, you know, start getting my stems and cutting them up and doing some Skrillex type stuff. But it's yeah. a question of somebody out there can do that better than me and yeah i should probably focus on what i'm you know my my natural um inclinations rather than sort of going crazy and doing some cyber japanese death disco <laughs> well that's an interesting genre hey, i would like a to new genre it. it's a new genre. Hey, you produce a, a, a oh cyber death disco, japanese cyber death disco track you might have to give me a few weeks to figure out like even piece <laughs> together what that even means but hey it would be define it i don't think it exists so you could define I, it let's we could just chain reaction all of these different genres and just start creating all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff um but yeah and and on top of that yeah you could probably figure these genres out however the time it's going to take for you to figure that out is is going to set you back on your projects i would assume um like for me if somebody came and hired me and they're like yeah we need this full orchestral danny elfman type thing i'm like i'll get there eventually but right now it would take me months to, to yeah. get that figured out and, and all that. So I think it's best right now to pass that on and I can take, take on a project where it would take me more of a week and I know it's going to sound quality. Yeah. And play to your strengths. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, um, cool. Well, that's all the questions that I have. And I think this discussion went really well. Um, Awesome. I know you, uh, you talked about uh, crazy frog too. You know, I know, but, uh, kind of want to i'm sure you've kind of tired of hearing about that um hey, well he's making he's making a he's made a comeback quite recently hasn't he so um he will yes he will probably haunt me till the day i die but it's it's been <laughs> what 50, 20 nearly 20 years since i was kind of working with the crazy frog so i think enough yeah. time has enough enough time has gone by and uh bridge water under the bridge to be able to sort of yeah yeah look at, look at it now uh, with yeah. fond memories rather than like oh god what was that yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Crazy Frog, and I, I'm sure you're probably one of the masterminds behind it that got me into it. Um, I remember buying their albums, and oh, really? You bought the albums? Yeah. So I don't think I wasn't one of the masterminds. I was part. I was more part of the marketing uh, drive behind that. Um, so I think you know, creatively, I can't take any of the glory. Um, sure. But it was, uh, it was so. So you you were buying that back in what was it 2005? Oh yeah, I heard Crazy Frog on. Uh, I don't remember where it was, but I heard it, and I'm like, I need that album, and I think I got it yeah. for my birthday or something. And I would listen to it over and over and over <laughs> again because I loved that <laughs> Euro dance type music. And then I got yeah. into you know Cascada and yeah. uh, Darude when Sandstorm came out and on all that stuff. It just I yeah. perpetuated my love for that kind of hands up hard dance music. Yeah, well, I think it, the, you know, the Axel F, um, I don't know about all of them, yeah. but certainly the Axel F was a sort of like a techno production guys um, based in, I think they're in Berlin in Germany because uh, the, the, the company behind it was all, there was, there was a German company and I think the, the producers of that track were German based as well. But yeah. Although it was originally, I think it was, a, was it a Danish guy that did the ring ding ding and then a Swedish oh, yeah. guy that designed the crazy frog and then the Germans that bought the rights to it. So it was a kind of a whole European pincer movement. Yeah, those Germans, they're they they're, they've got some, <laughs> they're sneaky, aren't they? Those Germans, they're, they're sneaky. Them. They've they've they uh, they've got some of the best music that I listen to. Uh, comes yeah. out of Germany, I think. A lot of good, really. Hey, good well, they they music. make loads of amazing software as well. Like Native Instruments is all German. Um, Melodyne is German. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, they're really they kind of they're really into that sort of technical technical wizardry. I feel like uh, Ableton is German too, or is that possibly yeah. Else? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know either. But uh, well, Jim, this has been an amazing conversation. I learned a lot from you, and I, I appreciate you breaking down all these different concepts and kind of going yeah, into pleasure. the weeds a little bit. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so before I let you go, is there anybody? Is there anything that uh, you would like to say, or how can listeners follow you and and keep up with the work that you're doing? 
Well, I, I would say follow me on social media, but I, I'm, I'm a very reluctant social media. Um, I, I have a love hate. Well, it's not so much a love hate as more as hate hate relationship with social media. I think the best place to find me, um, you have a listen to my podcast, Sync Music Matters. Um, yes. I sort of, on a, I'm on a mission to kind of explore the the, the people in the process behind uh, you know some of the mm. most amazing music that we hear in, in sort of TV, film, and games. Um, so I'm chatting to composers, but also directors, editors, sync agents, mm. people like that. I'm trying to just sort of understand how they operate and what makes them great at what they do. So yeah, Sync Music Matters, that's on Spotify and Apple. Um, and if you want to come find me, my digital abode is uh, larpmusic.com, L-A-R-P music.com. 